Oh. Right, everybody, I've pressed record. Right, welcome everybody and to another wonderful and session as part of the New Politics and Afrofuturism program. And for those of you who've not come across the program, we're basically calling for Black Radical Imagination and Pop Culture as a powerful vehicle for propelling progressive social justice narratives to mainstream audiences with a specific focus in arts and culture, for futurism, of course, black activism, climate justice, along with political theory and practice. And for those of you not familiar with the University of the Underground, a free, pluralistic and transnational university, which is actually based in the basement of nightclubs in its headquarters in Amsterdam. But as you can see, due to the global events, the program is all going online. So we have got an absolutely amazing um, guest for this session. It's titled In Conversation with Ishmael Butler. And just to, if I can do it a bit of justice, and I'm sure Ishmael will also kind of probably chip in at some point, but um, just to kind of say a bit of his bio, Ishmael Reginald Denine Butler is a Grammy award-winning American rapper, record producer, and songwriter. He is um, best known for his work, such as within the groups as um, Digable Planets and Shabazz Palaces. And I know I'm going to probably butcher it, and um, Digable Planets. Digable, Digable Planets. <laughs> that's, digable that's, planets. <laughs> that's part of the gospel of hip-hop right there. <laughs> so Digable Planets, 1992 single Rebirth and Slick Cool Light that achieved commercial and critical success charting on Billboard Hot, uh, Hot 100, uh, known for uh, merging hip-hop with jazz and philosophical lyrics. The group has re released two albums before disbanding in the mid-1990s. And in 2009, Butler formed Shabazz Palaces with his neighbor, Tende Merere. Butler also became a member of the Sub Pops A&R team in 2019. Shabazz Palaces frequently collaborate with a host of people and they mainly remix other artists in the latter and cause and case often reinventing entire tracks as a whole. Notable collaborations are and the supergroup Woke formed with Flying Lotus and Thundercats. And Shabazz Palaces are part of the Black Constellation which are a collective of visual artists, fashion designers and musicians. So and um, Ishmael we are truly and honored to have you and joining us live and from Seattle. We've had, as part of the program, we've had a host of many amazing people, but to say like, to have you here today is truly, truly creme de la creme. So thank you for taking the time to share your wisdom and thoughts with us today. So um, you are most welcome. Uh, thank you, it's good to be here. I came in uh, years ago, not too many years ago, did a show at UM and uh, I taken around, met a lot of people and was, fascinated by what was going on. So uh, Nelly and I always keep in touch and uh, anytime she wants me to be included in anything, it's always a pleasure for me to do it, you know, cause uh, I love it. I believe in the, in the institution and what's going on. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Amazing, Appreciate thank you it. so much. And we also um, got uh, Chris who's basically gonna be uh, tag teaming me today. Do you wanna say a few words, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there, we're hoping to get into a lot today, more specifically in terms of like how, how you started to craft the visuals and the substance of what it is that you created across your career. Um, for many of us in the room, we've been following from the early, very early stages, so we're very familiar with the music. Um, but maybe something that hasn't been explored as much in great detail was maybe the thought behind the visuals. And, the, and uh, the research, the production, the meanings behind it. So what we're really hoping to do is dive into that a bit. And of course, you know, feel free to drop some gems along the way in terms of what sparked um, the, the development. Um, but the reason that we're really, um, that we're hoping this will inform the researchers that we have that are full time, as well as the visiting participants, because they are developing a project that is specifically looking at the, visu the visuals and the philosophy behind when humanity and the environment thrive together. And I think mm. you're borrowing from a lot of examples of work that have created that link between dreaming into new worlds, bringing in connections from different spaces and trying to create this new aesthetic or these new symbols coming together. Is that fair to say? Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, I think it's a good observation too. I think it's a, a rich, fertile observation as well so um 
I'm curious to uh, looking forward to getting into that, you know, because <clears throat> I haven't thought about it in that way, but I, I think that 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 ideology is sort of at the at the base of where I'm coming from with things. So I appreciate that, what you said. And uh, yeah, let's do it. Great. I think what we have here are a list of questions that the participants have created. Um, but just before we jump into them, I also wanted to bring a connection that I can find in regards to the practice of Afrofuturism, the connection with Sun Ra, as well as a lot of the ancient civilization symbology that we found in um, that in one of the previous talks, we had a gentleman called Robin Walker come in and talk about the, the level of knowledge and proficiency in different African communities and what they've been able to display. And there's a lot of visual elements that we're seeing in your work that are also transgressed from Sun Ra and the other work as well as here, which I think is a great kind of lineage to people to see how it works within music and within the arts and within entertainment. So on that note, I would like to kind of jump into some of the questions that people have. Okay. Um, and I guess some of the first one is, are you aware of all of the meanings and the connections of, your, of the visuals in your work? Am I aware of them? Yeah. Are you conscious of what you're selecting? Well, you know, all of the visuals that accompany the Shabazz Palace's music are collaborative, you know? Mm -hmm. So I can't say that I'm 100% aware of all of them, but I'm aware of where we're coming from, you know? And, and, and in the collaborations, I'm aware of, um, what we're drawing from and what we're trying to do, but to say that I'm specifically aware of all of them, no, I'm not. Okay. And I, I appreciate your candor in that because there's, I think it's really, op it's really good for people to be open about the things that they're referencing. And so mm -hmm. we have one question from Iris. Um, would you like to come off mute to ask that question? I'm assuming you can jump in on that. Iris is nuts. Um, she's running nuts. behind. Well, I can ask that question for her on her behalf. Okay. Then, um, which she's asking is, what future landscape are you working on at the moment, if you're able to share? And that's, I guess, in, in whether music or in visuals. What, what, what landscape would you say? What future landscape? So what kind of things are you pulling together to create a particular environment or... Hmm. Past, present, and future are very, uh, I don't see a division between them, past, present, and future, everything connected. Um, mm. Things that, that, that you do in the now obviously affect what happens in the future, but they also color and move things that have happened in the past from uh, discipline, practice, work, exploration, research, fun, play, I feel like being determined in these aspects of um, what I like to do, making music and, and making art, that having that approach of, of discipline and practice makes it possible to, yeah, I, I don't really think in terms of, okay, I'm gonna make this kind of future, but I do think about things that I want to do and I know that the, the, the way to do them is to, Imagine them, but also really to just practice and, and you and, and, and exercise discipline. So that's how I'm doing it. Like, because through work and through practice and through discipline, I'm able to find out a lot of things that I wouldn't be able to know without doing it. So nothing really specific um, other than, you know, certain plans on albums and, and, and videos and film projects. But I would like to have an environment in which myself and the people around me that I'm working with have freedom, but also are being challenged by ourselves and, and our, our wants and ideas. And also to help people out to see a new way, to see a way to empower themselves and envision um, futures that they wouldn't have thought of if they hadn't been exposed to some of the things me and the people I work with have done. Amazing. Um... Thank you for that. There's another question that I would like to ask about. Imwen, would you like to come? Um, Imwen, would you like to come on and ask that? I know you got a couple, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
seen them all. Um, Are you on the dock? No, I'm not. I'm not. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I can. I'll throw it into the chat in case people want to. You know in the mean? meantime, while I do that, I'll, I'm going to ask, you know, like, it's kind of leaning away from that, but how do you know when a song's finished? So sort of like when, you're, when you're creating a piece of work, how do you know when it's finished? Well, I, I would say that, um, I would say that it, to me, a song is, is not finished. There's processes that are complete. Um, there's a process of imagining a song before you do anything physical, like recording it or writing it down. It's just something floating around in your imagination. That process has a completion. And then you go into a next step of recording it and uh, reimagining it, changing it. That process has a, uh, uh, a beginning and an end. Even after the song is recorded and committed to tape and is released, now you go and play it live and it becomes different then. And, and, and you might remix it or play it in a different key or reimagine it or sing it differently. So I don't think it's ever really finished, but there are processes in the development of a song that are complete, but in the end, it kind of lives on and changes on uh, forever. Thank you for that. How do you know when the song is finished? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. This is your time in Ben. Go for it. How do I know when the song <laughs> when they're playing it on the radio? <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Can I follow that up with Jill? Jill, you have a really, um, I think a question that leads really nicely to that. Would you like to come off mute? Yeah, sure. Go for it. All right. Uh, my question was, first of all, thanks for being here. I'm an admirer, of course. Uh, this, Thank you. Uh, I was thinking like, does the rhythm and the beats, do they influence like the things you write? Or do you write things and then you make, then you think of a rhythm or is it both in your process? Yeah, interesting. For me, there's things that I write that are independent of the music, but they never, they never really take a shape musically or rhythmically. They'll just be an idea. Uh, once uh, I make a beat or make a song and I'm looking for some lyrical inspiration, maybe I'll go back to that. Um, that idea, that lyric or those words, and then fit it in rhythmically to the music. So for me, I like to, I like for all the lyrics and the music to be rhythmically customized to the um, beat. So um, yeah, I, um, I may have an idea that um, is just a, an idea, a lyric or, or um, something I would think a song should be about but it never really gets developed until the music is laid down. Great. Does that answer your question? All right, thanks. Does, does that answer your yeah, question? Thank you. Oh, okay. Nice. Um, I'd like to follow up with April. April has a couple of questions, but she's also got, um, I think, two really good ones that I think can, that will help elaborate on that. April, can you come off mute, please? Of course, is this the one you've highlighted, yeah? Yeah, I thought that was, unless you can go for another one if you want. No, that's cool. Um, hey, I just wanted to, I wondered, like, obviously listening to your music is full of, like, layers and distortions of sound, um, mm -hmm. which I love. I just wanted to know more about your thought process when you're, like, creating this sort of, um, creating these songs and soundscapes, basically, and what your favourite sounds are to sort of incorporate. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um. I think no matter what artist, what, what field an artist is in, the artist is gonna attempt to create, whether subconsciously or consciously, they're gonna attempt to create that in art which most excites them or most uh, gets them most um, interested in, in, in whatever they're um, sort of consuming. So for me, I like to, my favorite kind of music is music that surprises me, that uh, catches me off guard, that's weird to me, but it's somehow familiar at the same time. So I feel like that's what I'm trying to get to when I'm making music, you know what I mean? So, and with that, um, I use a lot of instruments, keyboards, drum machines, 
but I rarely use the raw sound that comes off of the keyboards using a lot of um, things to um, morph the sounds, pedals, um, plugins, you know, shit like that to explore the sound and see what other kind of textures that I can bring out of it other than what is presented um, just at the base of things, you know? So I'm trying to be unique, trying to exercise my instinct so that I can try to get as close to something original as possible. Yeah, I feel that it's working. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We've got believers, we've got believers. Yeah. All right, Adnan. Hi, um, you've said in an interview that you're driven to create, that to create is equivalent to surviving. Like you have, um, could you speak to that struggle and share some of those perspectives? Yeah, well, yeah, well, I said, you said I, I said I was driven to, oh, oh, I think, I think I know what I was thinking about. <laughs> um, hip hop um, is, is a, is an art form. We consider it an art form, you know, and um, a musical form, but at its core, it was really a survival form. So you got people who are faced with a, a social condition that is adverse to say the least. And so when you're in this condition, in this situation, um, human nature is compelling you to figure out a way to survive day to day. It's the basics, eat, sleep, that kind of stuff. But also expression is a, is a, necessity for life, I feel, and creation, and that necessity to create is how hip hop and jazz and, and, and different types of dance forms and stuff uh, came about here in the United States of America. So I think I was speaking to that fact and that um, reality is that when you're surviving, not only do you need the necessities for life, but you need to create and you need to um, express and um, represent your feelings and try to achieve joy and whatever's oppressing you, you can kind of get outside of that with your creation. So I think that's what I was speaking to uh, in that quote. Cool. Does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, Inven, you have one another question that I thought would be linking to the, the background of Ishmael's work. Would you like to jump on that? You have to unmute, by the way. There we go. Okay. I'm on unmuted. Ah, that was <laughs> That was a question for the previous. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Go for it. I know you've got a couple of questions. Go yeah, for I it. Have a couple, I have a couple of questions. So I guess I had another question, which was, so for you making work as, as an artist, what was the main difference between sort of making work in the, as an artist in the 90s and sort of making work as an artist now? And, you know, I guess, you know, we're in a social media age, age as you know, mm. How does that sort of impacted, you know, your practice, your work, you know, how you think about the creation process? Yeah. Well, I started making music um, in an attempt to release music commercially in 1990. And at that time, you only could make music and get it commercially released by putting it through a record label. You know what I mean? There was no self-release stuff because the bureaucracy of it was 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 strangled by the record industry you know so you had to get signed to a label there weren't that many opportunities to get signed to a label it was a much more a longer period of time and an arduous time and also nothing was really promised so that's the biggest thing like if you make a song in your room right now you know for a fact that it can be released. You know, you can put it on YouTube, you can put it on Spotify yourself. 
But when I when I was um, started out, that was like to get a song released was that was a very rare thing, you know. So that's the biggest difference: the freedom of opportunity and the um, the exponential uh, access to equipment. Like you know, you can you can get a home studio with just a few pieces, a computer, a MIDI keyboard, and and a, and a, a digital audio workspace. You know what I mean? And you can you can be on a billboard charts in a couple of months. So the access to equipment, um, affordability, and also being able to put shit out fast and without any uh, financial backing is the biggest difference to me. Great. I mean, just to, out of curiosity, what was your first, la- who were you signed to, your first label? Okay, so the first label I signed to was a, was a, a independent label called Pendulum. Which was yeah. which was a subsidiary of Electra Records. Right. Okay. Yeah. They had a good. And, uh, all of, all of those labels have been absorbed by the bigger conglomerates now. You know. So yeah. Okay. Um. On that note, there's a question in here. Someone messaged me, so I'm just, just to give it context. Um, okay. Thinking about Electra Records, there's uh, they have a good connection with a lot of artists like Busta Rhymes who've speak a lot of, on knowledge of self. Yes. And the question that somebody's asked me is, is how instrumental was knowledge of self and, and African-American history, not necessarily slavery in your musical journey? journey? Right on. So my mother um, and father, Barbara and Reginald, they um, grew up as activists, nationalists, you know, so... Mm. They were traveling around the southern states in America, going to rural counties and and um, getting people to vote, signed up to vote. So when I grew up, um, community service, self-awareness, historical awareness was was paramount in my daily life. You know, so I carried that into my teenage years um, and in my college years. Um, I dropped out of school and started to make music in the late 80s. And then the, the other brother in my group, um, Knowledge, he was a he was a five percenter. So he actually introduced me to the five percent nation. Mm-hmm. He gave me the lessons, and and I studied with him and taught with him. But at that time, I mean, you know, Public Enemy was the really the the, the pinnacle for us making music at that time, where you had to have this awareness, this political awareness, uh, some determination, self-determination, um, and also and also be funky, you know what I mean? So that's what everybody was really trying to do, you know, was to emulate that that level of, of all awareness in music. So it was very um, instrumental, very necessary, and, you know, it wasn't even a choice to us back then. It was something you either did or you weren't involved. You know what I mean? So, Interesting. yeah, everybody, you know, all of the groups, even the NWA on down to like sort of happy dancing groups like Kid and Play, like everybody was, you know, wearing the African medallions. And it wasn't just a superficial thing. We all sort of had a unified purpose in terms of upliftment uh, of our people and, and being aware of where we had come from and having some say in where we were going, you know? Right. No, absolutely. I think it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of what it is, um, the discussion around that. Um, mm-hmm. There are a few more questions. Is there anybody in the chat that had any questions they wanted to raise before I jump back into the other students' questions? Just raise your hand and let me know, and then we can jump to that. Right. Oh, Michael, um, I just, yeah. Do you want to unmute yourself? I, I just asked, asked you a question that you just messaged me. Okay, sure. Just just one question to add on to that. Um, if you look at current hip hop, if we look at where black communities are, often they're very they're linked to um, what people see as poverty culture and call that black history. How do we get back to where knowledge of self and elevating blackness into high culture is possible? You know, if if you were president, let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> what what are the things that you think in the black community we need to do to get to connect black culture to high culture again? Well, I mean, obviously that's a, a, a deep question. In my opinion, 
at this point in time, all over the world, but especially here in America, progress, success, properness, quality, um, value, all of these things are measured against whiteness. You know what I mean? So we, my, my, my thing would be to detach your own sense of self and your own sense of value, your own sense of community, your own sense of progress, your own sense of success, to detach that from what white people and white culture and white supremacy has provided as that truth. So I would be, and it wouldn't be a, an immediate plan. This is something that would take 30, 40, 50 years and you have to start out understanding, hey, we got to break away from this notion that whiteness is what is to be achieved and that you measure yourself against that. And once that happens, because if you separate whiteness from that and the myth of it, you start to see that, you know, everything is, 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 is okay because you're not trying to live up to something that is not only impossible, no one's going to allow you to live up to it, but it's designed to keep you always striving for something that you can't get to. You know what I mean? So independence of that, and it doesn't mean that you hate white people or you don't like them or you want to kill them or they need to all be removed. It just means that you don't think about them when you're thinking about yourself and, and, and the collective. You know what I mean? So my thing would be to figure out a way to to um to break that link, to break that chain that is we have to drag around in every situation that we're getting into. And that's where I would I would try to begin. Thank you for that. Um we have another question. Um is there anyone else that has that has a question before I jump to one of the student questions again? Okay, and then go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it sort of hits it hits on sort of what you've touched on, but um, are you involved in any political movements sort of like currently? And if you are, sort of how do they influence or do they influence the current work that you're making? Yeah, no, I'm not involved. Um, for me, politics is something that I, people that are, that are in that, that have that um, sort of um, innate um, desire and predisposition to be interested in that and pursue that and try to affect change, I admire and respect that. It's not, um, I don't have that in me, but I draw from those that do and, and the results that they make. And it, it, it fuels what I am passionate about, which is my, uh, which is creative things, you know? I, I see them as being um, different, but at the same time, whenever there's a political movement or people are marching or somebody's making a speech or something, there's always music involved, you know what I'm saying? So they need one another to um, nourish one another. And so I try to pay attention, I don't, I write off anything that any group of people is doing. I try to extract stuff out of it and pay attention to them and learn from it, though I'm not involved, but it does enrich what I am passionate about and what I am involved in. So the short answer is no, but I wanted to qualify it in, in a little bit to say that um, I respect when, when people are into it like that because it, it takes a lot of work and it's selfless, selfless as well, you know, so it, it has to be, commended and, and respected so that's how i feel thank you yeah. yeah just off of that i know we have some students here that have been working just in that kind of vein like thinking about those things so for example sarah i know would you be interested in coming in just to speak about a little bit about what it is that you're doing and how some of this might inform your work as you transition from room to room <laughs> <laughs> just remember to unmute if you can hello so yeah i mean the research that i want to do um i want to look at colonial repatriations basically looking about how we can take back from everything that was looted from our homelands in the past couple hundred years and you know really working with the political movements that have been happening 
So the one mm. thing that I've been thinking about recently as well is there was a small movement, it wasn't as big as it should have been, and it can be a lot bigger, to um, get museums to send back all, all the looted property <laughs> that they've taken over the hundreds of years, all of it, just empty them out and send it back. Um, you know, how you can build a movement and a discourse about that. You know, one thing that I always, always struck me is whenever there was programs about the queen and all her jewelry, I was like, that's not your jewelry. That's my grand's jewelry. You know, you've got wow. no owning of that. That comes from where I grew up or my parents grew up. That comes from my heritage. You know, how do we get that back? You know, I think part of that is also claiming the, the, the our history that they're taking from us. You know, they've taken mm. us to make us think that white is power white is the only truth that there is and you know part of the whole decolonial structure of it is bringing back the knowledge that there is so much history so much power so much knowledge in our heritage that's been completely whitewashed and i think getting the financial repatriation is kind of like part of that stepping stone because you know money is what makes the world go round, and you need that financial repatriation to like as one of the key elements to fill that hole mm -hmm. yeah so Sarah, yeah. are you gonna tell Ishmael that you're building a new banking system? <laughs> I mean, you keep on when saying I'm building a new banking huh? system. I don't. You keep on saying I'm building a new banking system, which scares me. But yeah, I wanna, I wanna build something where we can get that money back. But if it's Ooh. a banking system, if it's a service, <laughs> if it's just a discourse, there where you start challenging these authorities and power and getting to talk about it, then yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's interesting because that, that's kind of what I was saying in terms of when the brother asked me what I would do as a leader, because, I mean, just think about the banking system, the currency system, like, it's just an invention, you know what I mean? It, and, and if you look at the way things rise and fall, it's, it's not really held together by anything concrete. So if we could separate ourselves from those kind of systems and come up with our own, which had our own considerations, our own ideas, different from that, that's how you become independent of them. And then to me, relations with everybody else would be much, much better, you know? So it sounds far-fetched and, and, and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, that's what it, what it really requires to break the chains of all the stuff that's sort of been cemented over the years in our, in our psychology, you know what I mean? So I respect that. And, it, it might not be something you get to see. You know, a lot of us think about change and we want to see the change, mm. but that's not how it works. You know, uh, take the Great China Wall or the pyramids and shit. Motherfuckers worked for years, hundreds of years to build those things with a purpose in mind. And that's how they were able to complete it. And somebody had to start it, you know, and they didn't see it finished. So I respect that where you're coming from. And um, that's, that's a good start. And people will be inspired by what you're doing and pick that up long after you know you're not here no more you know what i mean and that's what it's going to take a, a long plan with long vision you know mm. just one thing to add on to oh sorry so do you want to add something oh, yeah i'm just going to add on like how it reminds me of basic Gaddafi who tried to implement a pan-africanism where they were going to take all the all the profits from oil and resources in the country and have it only for africa and not export it and then he was black labeled as a dictator all this negative propaganda, you know, and he tried, yeah. you know, he, yeah. you know, for, for better or for worse, he was a dictator, he was a strong leader in an African state, but he tried to benefit and then, you know, he was completely black labeled for it. But, you know, as, as, as we all know, we're not, we're not finishing any process, we're in the middle of everything, right? And so right. We're all part of creating a stepping stone for people. Right. Yeah. Just one thing, to, to, you mentioned something that was really interesting about the idea of starting, you know, before we look at these great marvels, we start from somewhere, there's that starting block. And just to kind of bring it full back, um, back to Luke to the work that you've been doing is that it's all very, um, the language about it is really based on looking at space and stars and solar systems from all the way back from diggable planets, if you're looking at the title. Um, yeah. Iris, unfortunately, she's not here, but she had a question unless she's popped up in the room somewhere, I'm just double checking. She just wants to find out a question like, what is um, your relation or your interest with sci-fi and space um, and, and music? Where do they kind of cross over for you? Okay. Um, I really don't have any like lines of delinea delineation in my 
life, you know, mm. in my thought, in my creativity. So it's always mixing in and swimming together. I grew up listening to Star Child, Parliament, Funkadelic, George Clayman, all his boys, you know what I'm saying? Catch mm. that. And, and then, you know, Sun Ra and all his cohorts, you know, so you're talking about people that supremely disciplined, mm. supremely passionate, supremely skilled, um, different points in time having, you know, elevated states of mind on um, drugs and, you know, different kind of stuff. So these cats are tapping into um, space, the inner spaces with inside of them that's, 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 that's sort of coded on their chromosomes from millennia ago. You don't know where these cats came from or what, what they're descendants of, you know? So when people talk, oh, they're talking all that space shit. To me, I took it as literal that they were speaking about things that either they were being called to from their own um, memories, their cell memories, or things that they had experienced in reality for themselves. So, you know, sort of Western society and culture wants to like tap into space by making metal machines that tear through space and like go off into the stratosphere and beyond. But at the end of the day, we're all the same thing. And a lot of cultures felt like you could understand space, go to space, travel to space and back without any of that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I believe in, in those things. I, I don't practice them. I don't know how to do them myself at this time, but I still believe in possibilities. So um, I think it's a reality that we all can tap into in some way or another. So that's how I listen to it. And that's how I participate with it as real, as, as tangible, physical reality, as well as ideas and metaphysical stuff as well. But again, like all of those terms are things that people came up with. There's real things that happen underneath those terms that no one could ever come up with a name for them because they're too, um, they're too, they're too real, you know, they're too, they don't need a name to exist, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I'm interested in that. So space is a metaphor for, you know, being open, being vast, being mysterious, being certain, being precise, being wild, being chaotic. All of those things is kind of a metaphor for that. But also there's the reality of those things as well that are very influential too. Life is a constant conversation with nature. Humans have kind of extracted ourselves out of it because we wanted to dominate and control, but we're still a part of this whole system of things that's going around naturally. And I try to go further into that rather than, than going away from it. No, I, I completely understand. We've got a couple of people who are, who are definitely agreeing with what it is that you're saying in their video. Um, I just want to bring another person in. Ananya, are you there? Hello, are you there? Yes, I am. My phone is my phone is acting up a lot. I am here. I am. I've been listening all the while, all right. and my phone is not allowing me to unmute myself or send a text. I'm so sorry. No worries. If you if if can you ask your question now? If not, you can write it in the chat, and I'll ask it for you. But um, go for it. Try have a go at it. Well, uh, I don't have a specific question right yeah. now, but okay. I will in a while. So. Okay. There is. Okay, I will have. It. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. All right. We'll wait for your. We we'll wait for you to type it in. <laughs> I think everyone will deal with this balancing multiple kind of objects at the same time. Um, there is another question that is kind of lingering that's just been sent over, which has been asking about the. I know that you're you're you've worked with you're working with Flying Lotus Thundercat regards to woke, um, sampling different music from different places and different sounds. And something that's popping up is also Afrobeat, which is kind of like blown up. <laughs> and yeah. What are your thoughts on that in terms of it coming into the mainstream? You know, is it something that you think is a stay, that's a connection, or is it something that kind of, you know, you think will pass on? And does that have a role in your music at all? Hmm. You know, I tend to like not 
pay much attention to the commercial waves of stuff, you know, because I get it, you know, now people are, you know, they're hearing the music and it's becoming popular and now they might play it at half times of the football games and stuff like that. And that's cool. But these are, these are variations and forms of things that have been, been here forever. You know what I mean? So I see it on the superficial level and not, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just, the surface level, but I, I tend to think of it more in the sediments of life, you know? And I think African music, Afrobeat, or whatever you want to call it, this, this, this incarnation of it, mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's, it's the music of the earth, you know? It's the music of, of mankind, the expression, it's the ore, really, of, of us and, 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 and the people of the world. So I, I dig it, you know, it's gonna come and go in waves and something else will come up and everything, but it's cool to see it and hear it and see the personalities and the, um, the, the characters that are, are, are the purveyors of it because it's, it's just always cool to see Africa, you know, uh, at work and live because it's so, so dynamic and colorful and beautiful and rich and the people that uh, come from there and the, and the diaspora are just superhuman and supernatural and it's, it's always amazing. So Great. yeah, that's what I would say to that. I appreciate that. Um, I've just got another question from um, someone who unfortunately can't come off of mute, but um, her question is, it's a deep one. Um, how are you locating hope um, in this moment, in your life at the moment? Yeah. That's a that's an existential question right there. Yeah. Um, you know, I have kids. You know, my daughters and a son. Um, it's hard now because I'm 51. And I've seen a lot of things, a lot of movements, a lot of rises and falls. And now, you know, in this time, especially being an American, living in, in, in the Trump era, it, it's, it's desolate, you know, and it's, it's, it's anemic in terms of joy and hope and happiness just being um, readily available. But um, whenever, in any situation, like people talk about, um, writer's block or unable to be able to paint or unable to be able to come up with a poem. Mm. I learned early that when you feel those, when you have those type of obstacles that through discipline and practice and work and um, staying busy mm -hmm. and physical exercise and activity that you open yourself up to be able to identify um, hopeful things, happy things, inspirational things. And you might go long periods of time when you can toil, but you don't get those returns, but you kind of have to um, believe. And even, even if you don't have sort of faith in uh, specific deities and things like that, in the humankind, in, 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 in the human struggle, you can have faith that perseverance and, and work and discipline will get you to those kind of hopeful things. So it's a deep question. That was my immediate answer. I, something like that I would have to think about uh, much more, but that's what uh, I thought of instinctively to say. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, there's one uh, question that I think is a great segue for this. And it's, okay. it's coming talking about generations and music. And I know before you, that, um, there was musicians in your family, now you, and then the next one. So April, would you like to jump in and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering about um, the sort of creation, creative relationship between you and your son, how that's yeah. kind of like evolved over time and like fed into your own creative process going forward as a solo artist as well. Right on, right on. So my son, um, so his mother and I, we, we split up. And he was still very young, like five. So he would come live with me and go to school. And then he would go home and live with his mother and go to school sometime. But the times he was with me when he was young, he was very, um, like he didn't really like school that much, but like he would come down in the studio and like pick up the guitar and like 
sit with it for five, four or five hours at a time. He would like get on like the computer and Ableton and stuff and like garage band and shit like that. And he would like figure out how to, you know, teach himself how to make songs and stuff like that. So very young, like I would say when he was in middle school, I realized like, okay, he's got the the passion to make something uh, of his his musical interest. So we we we've been making songs and messing around in the studio since he was, you know, 13, 14 years old. So then when he branched out on his own and started getting with his crews and his bros and making his music and stuff like that, mm. um, I was always inspired. I always wanted him to sort of have something um, vocational to kind of fall back on, which I recognize now is just kind of a parental default. You know what I'm saying? But he was, he kind of had that attitude like, you know, <laughs> and maybe he got it from me, but he had to go all in without having anything to fall back on in order to actually realize anything in terms of success, you know? So once, once that happened, um, and I realized that's how he was feeling in life and that's how he was on it, I just sort of accepted it. And um, um, we've always had a good relationship, very open, very honest, friend, friendship as well as um, me being a, an authority figure as well as somebody that he can, you know, come to with his problems and stuff like that. So I've been fortunate to have a good relationship with him. Working wise, he lives in LA. So whenever we get together, if I go down there or he comes up here, we always get in the studio and, and make songs and mm. talk about ideas and play songs and stuff like that. So we good. We, we, we probably got about six or seven songs that we've made and we always talk about releasing shit like that. And so, you know, it's, it's just, it's really good. I'm, I'm influenced by him because when you have kids, you, you really see yourself in them. Like literally, like, wow, like this guy's actually living an alternative life of mine, you know, like, mm. so it's inspirational. And I, I won't say steal from him, but I, I am inspired by some of his sensibilities, some of his instincts. I'm like, oh, that's fresh. You know what I'm saying? And I might not work it into my music literally, but mm. the energy of it helps to, um, I would say, keep me abreast of some shit that I probably would miss if my son wasn't involved in it. a lot of newer artists and stuff like that. So I think it's healthy um, and I benefit from it. And I, I, I think he would say that he does too. So it's like a way, you know, it's, it's cool. I like it. Appreciate it. Yeah. And we're trying to finish on time. So there's just the new original Butler. Thank you so much for your time with all of us. My Thank pleasure. You. And we have, um, do you have the time for one last question by Anania? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, she of course. was in a, like, where are you, Anania? Come back to us. I was there, but my phone was acting up, so I couldn't hear properly. And the network was very bad because of my bad network connection. So my question is, do you think, in a way, music <laughs> is more accessible to the masses than poetry? Because music requires, I think, according to me, a lot less intellectual and emotional labor than poetry. Because uh, in, in listening, in the audience, in audiences, because writing both music and poetry is equally difficult. But uh, but, uh, but an audience, uh, a member of the audience, would uh, relate to music more than poetry. What are your thoughts on this? I felt this personally. So. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think because um, music has the... Um, added influence of vibration and sound, rhythm, that people are able to sort of uh, latch on to it. They, uh, music can be independent of words, you know? So it's almost a um, relinquishing of that sort of faculty of deciphering something and you can just give yourself all the way over to the sound. So yes, I do think it is a little bit more accessible than uh, poetry. Um, um, for people. I agree. Hi. Chris, you want to drop it up? Thank yeah. you. Thank you for managing to come on, Ananya. We appreciate it.
Yeah. Um, so on that note, I think we've officially come to, to make sure that we finish on time, we've officially come to a close. Um, okay. We just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out to answer these questions and to share your insight in terms of your work, your process, and all the things that you're doing. Is there anything that you, we should be supporting, we should keep, be keeping an eye out for where we can go to find out more? Um, well, I make music um, with Shabazz Palaces, uh, Sub Pop Records, and um, if you just look online or, or Google or um, any of the streaming platforms, all the music is there. So um, it, you can find it on YouTube too, so it's free. So, you know, just check it out when you get a chance. And um, I appreciate y'all having me on and being a part of this amazing um, endeavor, man. And I, anytime y'all want to holler at me, I'll make myself available and I wish y'all all good luck, man. You're the best. I'm sure they appreciate it. Okay, we'll definitely send you a link of uh, what the things that they make <laughs> in the end. <laughs> yeah, right on. Do we have like an exclusive on like the next Shabazz song that is going to be released? Oh, so uh, I actually directed the video um, that we are editing now and it will be coming out probably early next year. And I'll release it all on my Instagram and stuff like that. I'll, I'll put notices up there. So my Instagram is just Shabazz Palaces and uh, I'll keep everybody uh, abreast of all the stuff that I got going on on there. It actually, you know what, like I forgot about this, but thank you, Felix, for reminding me. But, you know, I'm planning to do a giant Christmas song for the University of the Underground. Do you want to? Yeah, contribute? yeah. Like, a, like, a like Christmas tune, you know? OK. Like, yeah. Yeah. Have you done a Christmas song before? Never. See? <laughs> Sarah wrote one earlier on today. Like it was top notch. Highly recommend it. <laughs> I think Sarah should share that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's serious. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> On that note. Christmas <laughs> song. I mean, we can. He's coming. He's coming. It's quick. It's quick. Okay. Okay. Go on, Sarah. Oh, you ready? Wow. It's a Christmas yeah. rap. Go for okay. Oh, wow. Christmas is here. Where are you, my dear? As Rudolph would say, come ride me away. Let's make magic, Christmas magic together. You, me, baby, forever. Tits and tinsel, tits and tinsel, tits and tinsel. The Christmas tree is lit, but where baby is your clit? I'm waiting for you here under the mistletoe, all ready to be your ho. Ho, ho, ho. Nice. Nice. That's shaping up to be a Christmas classic, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can hear all the kids singing that now. Wow, you see what Cozy yeah. does to you? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm just excited for the well, music video. You gotta put that to music. The music video is gonna be there. Yeah, wow. if you put that to music, if you put that to music, that's going viral for sure. <laughs> you're, you're in the studio, mate. <laughs> Amazing. Listen, we won't we won't take over your time too much. We know that it's uh, uh, we appreciate everything that you've given for us, and we won't hold on to it any longer. On that note, please make sure everybody you sign up to Shabazz Palaces, check out his work. Make sure you follow him on Instagram. You know you're seeing some great work at play here, so please take inspiration from it and build on it. All right. I like that great work at play. That's great. I like. <laughs> yeah. Hey, credit, credit. I'm claiming yeah. credit. <laughs> That's the name of the next Shabazz album. <laughs> cool, man. Thank you. We appreciate it. We appreciate it a lot. All right, y'all. See you later. Blessings.